Hello, and welcome back to the Amped EV Podcast. My name is David, and I am the editor for The Buzz, and today we are talking about EV collisions. It's something that happens. We don't want to admit it. We don't want to talk about it, but it happens. The problem is that there's a lot of data out there about collisions on ICE vehicles and, you know, how long it might take when you send that car into the shop to get your car back and what kind of work they need to do and how much it's going to cost, all these different things. With EVs, yeah, the data's out there, but there's not nearly as much of it. EVs just haven't been on our roads quite as long. But thankfully, there are experts out there that can help us answer some of those questions. So today we are talking with Ryan Mandel. He is the Director of Claims Performance at Mitchell. Let's get to the interview. Ryan, it's great to meet you. Thanks for being on the podcast with us today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here and talk about this topic today with you. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. This is a really, really important one for people. Um, I wanted to bring up some of the more recent research uh, that Mitchell has put out here, um, talking about the uh, EV collision claims frequency and how that seems to be growing. Now, I don't want to go through this thing step, you know, uh, piece by piece with you here today, but I would encourage anybody who is interested in EV to definitely check it out because there's a lot of really, really interesting statistics in there. One question I did have for you, though, based on that research, what would you say is maybe the number one thing that consumers need to know about owning an EV in regard to claims and repairs and things of that nature? Yeah, I, th- I think they need to know that if they're involved in an accident in their EV, that they need to have a whole different set of expectations around what's going to go on as it relates to repairing that vehicle and bringing it back to pre-loss condition. You know, we say all the time that the, the, these vehicles are not simply just an electrified version of the internal combustion engine vehicle. Th- these are really something that are wholly different because of the complete re-engineering of all of the propulsion systems and the way that power is managed, the way that you achieve performance in these vehicles. So while they may look similar on the outside, obviously, once you get into the mechanics of them and, the, of course, the digital infrastructure of these vehicles, they're completely different. And that very significantly changes the requirements for collision repair. And we can't simply just use the same kind of labor calculations to determine the number of days it's going to take to repair. You know, there's ways that we've gone about that for, for years, you know, mm-hmm. dividing the number of labor hours by four, and that kind of gives you the number of days to repair. But with an EV, it really is quite different. You have to manage so many different systems on these vehicles as it relates to the repair, especially the high voltage battery. And while that definitely adds labor time to the overall repair process, it also adds additional delays in terms of getting that work done. So I would say to any consumer that has their EV going into a collision repair shop, you're probably going to be looking at a lengthier repair time than you would typically be used to in any other vehicle that you might have had in an accident prior. And um, you, you had mentioned, you know, in, in the past, there were different formulas you could try to use. Have the has the EV industry come up with anything like that at this point, or is it too early to say, or does it really just depend on you know the severity of the accident? I, I think it's very dependent on on the vehicle requirements, the specific requirements of that vehicle, hmm. and, and I think we're seeing that kind of throughout the industry as a whole, but more specifically to EVs. Uh, so I don't think there is a EV specific formula that exists for being able to predict that. Um, outside of traditional methods that we've used. But I I think what we're seeing when we look at our data in terms of cycle time or when these vehicles are in a repair facility is they're to normalize all the different variables. And we try to just look at maybe drivable vehicles, you know, 2018 model year and newer, things like that. We typically see an EV is going to have about two additional days worth of time in the shop uh, compared to all other propulsion types. So I I think... that's really a direct function of a couple different things. Number one, again, managing that high voltage battery. Uh, in many cases, the OEMs will require that that battery actually be completely removed from the vehicle during the course of repairs, depending on what's happening with that repair. So if the vehicle is getting welded on, that battery can't be in the vehicle. Uh, some manufacturers require the battery to be removed if it goes into a paint booth. 
because it can't be subjected to the high temperatures in a paint booth. So mm -hmm. there's a number of different, you know, it depends on the specifics of what has to happen during the course of repair. Very, very, very interesting. Um, uh, so based on all of that, what is the biggest hurdle for the collision industry when working on an EV? I, I, th I think training is number one. I think that is going to be the, the biggest roadblock that shops are facing is, is being able to stay properly trained on all of these vehicles and ensure that not only are they doing safe and proper repairs and quality work on these vehicles, but that they're keeping their their technicians and their employees safe uh, when they're working on these vehicles. You know, th this is a lot of energy that if managed improperly can cause devastating results um, if it's not being handled properly. So I think that's it, that requires an investment, and you know it definitely requires a, an investment not only monetarily but in, in time. And for an industry that is struggling to, I, I think, capture new technicians to the trade and to retain existing technicians, I, I think that becomes a, a big challenge. And you definitely have to have the resources again, not only in in terms of you know, financial resources, uh, but resources of time as well. Got it. Got it. Got it. When you when we're talking about time, what is what is taking so much time when the uh, vehicle is in the shop? Is it the fact that you have to remove the battery for so many of these uh, other processes to even begin those, or is is there a specific thing that is really adding on? You you had mentioned two days at one point. Is there anything that comes to mind that specifically is adding that extra time in the shop? Yeah, so I, I think the the big thing we can point to, you know, from a data perspective, is certainly you know the operations surrounding the battery, de-energizing the vehicle properly, the additional labor that that takes, mm -hmm. and again potentially removing the battery. But I would also say, you know, and we've heard a lot of stories you know, over the years about parts delays mm -hmm. with you know with all vehicles lately, but especially with some of these newer electric vehicles, especially the startup brands, where there's not as mature of a supply chain in place. You know, in terms of relationships with tier one suppliers. And so that can that can be a challenge with some of these vehicles. It's a new platform. And so I think anytime you have a new platform, regardless of the powertrain, you, you're li liable to run into part shortages and lack of availability of replacement parts. And especially with these electric vehicles, you, you don't have also, you know, we're, all, we're talking about mostly newer vehicles here. You know, mm -hmm. the average age of, an electric vehicle that's being repaired in a collision center is newer than 2020. So, you know, we're talking several years newer than the average internal combustion engine vehicle. So yeah. you don't have the same availability of recycled parts of aftermarket parts that could potentially supplement that supply chain. So I think the lack of availability of parts is causing some of that, some of that additional cycle time as well, in addition to the labor operations that you're finding. Sure, sure. And we're seeing that in uh, a lot of different applications now, not just EVs, but, um, you know, in uh, heavy duty as well. I mean, all, all kind of sectors of the aftermarket, um, we're definitely seeing that. I did want to ask, um, you know, another data point on uh, some of your more recent research, talking about the, um, the expense of repairing an EV tends to be a little bit higher than it would be for an ICE vehicle. Um, why do you think that is? is? Is it really because it's kind of a more specialized thing right now? Only certain technicians are able to do it? Or um, where is that extra expense coming from, in your opinion? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it actually comes down to something I think is relatively simple. And I think it's just the pure economics of the vehicle is one of the biggest driving mm. driving factors. You know, when we look at the average value, you know, average ad, actual cash value of an EV compared to an internal combustion engine that's being repaired. You know, the EV is roughly twenty thousand dollars more, has a twenty thousand dollar higher ACV. So when you think about a vehicle that's just worth more, it's like any any other vehicle. You you just have you have more room to actually be able to fix the vehicle before you start getting close to a total loss write off. Mm -hmm. So the, just the economics themselves of the vehicle, the fact that these are more valuable vehicles means that you're going to be able to write a higher dollar repair before it gets totaled. Now, if we were to look at more of an apples to apples type of, of scenario, then I think that's where we start looking at, again, you know, the labor functions. Where we see the biggest difference is in the labor. 
And, and that's really, I think, uh, attributed primarily to dealing with that high voltage battery. There's just, there's going to be more operations on an EV as opposed to an internal combustion engine vehicle. If you look at just the same pattern of damage, you're going to have to do more with the electric vehicle just to be able to fix it. You know, again, if you use the battery as an example, on internal combustion engine vehicles, yeah, you have to disconnect the battery, but you're talking, you know, a crescent wrench sure. and, and 10 minutes of time versus using a specialized scissor lift, two technicians to have to get the vehicle up on a hoist, remove this 1,600 to 2,000 pound battery, protect it, isolate it, you know, make sure it's de-energized. There's a lot more that goes into these operations. So I think that's that's the big driver when you look at kind of like for like. But mm-hmm. just the pure economics alone are going to drive a higher a higher cost in the electric vehicles compared to an ICE. Got it. Got it. That makes sense to me. Totally. Um, now, this is just some speculation on my part, but I, I would guess because um, Teslas tend to be, um, you know, one of the more frequent EVs that you see out on the road, that that is probably what a lot of technicians working on EVs have experience working on. Um, as other manufacturers start to get in the mix a little bit more, uh, proliferate the roads a little bit more, do you think that is going to uh, be, I don't want to call it a problem, but you know, it's going to change how the technicians know how to work on an EV? Are they, or is every EV kind of standard at, you know, because there's less moving parts and you know one EV, you kind of know them all? Yeah, I, I, I think it's only going to benefit the to see more diversification of the models that are on the road, mm-hmm. uh, primarily because I think it's going to provide greater exposure to the types of operations that technicians are going to be faced with. Mm-hmm. Are all EVs created equal in terms of how they have to be handled? No, I, I would say they're certainly not. However, there is a similarity in terms of the platform and mm-hmm. the construction of an EV. We, all EVs today essentially run on, you know, are built on this skateboard type platform mm-hmm. where the battery is kind of at the floor of the vehicle and you have you know, motors and powertrain that are kind of conjoined together at different parts of the vehicle. So I, I think those similarities will exist. And I, I think it'll be, I think it'll just take some time for this to mature in the marketplace. But as technicians are exposed to a wider array of these vehicles, I think it becomes less. I'm, taboo is not the right word, but it, it becomes less of something that is out of their comfort zone when mm. these vehicles come into come into their shop. So I think that will be a benefit. And I think we're going to start seeing, you know, again, as more models enter the marketplace, you're going to see Tesla's market share start start to, I, I think, get more evenly spread out. And mm. again, no, I don't think that's any fault of Tesla's. I think it's just consumers have a lot more options now at sure. different price points. And I think the automakers have committed to this strategy of electrification going back you know, a decade or so. And now we're starting to see it come to fruition in terms of what's actually available to consumers. And as that price parity starts to come into the market more over the next decade, that, that's when I think you really start to see more diversification of the models that are going to be on the road. That makes sense. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I really appreciate your time here. And again, I do want to encourage people to look at Mitchell's research on EVs. A lot of interesting stuff that we didn't have time to get into today, but um, it's it's really, really great. And you're coming out with new research all the time. So again, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. This was a ton of fun. Take care. Okay, that was a great interview. I could probably pick Ryan's brain all day about this kind of stuff. Um, One of the things he said that really got my attention was managing your expectations. If you own an EV, it has to go into the shop. You need to understand that it's probably going to take a little bit longer. And he was saying, you know, kind of on average, two additional days is what you can expect as compared to an ICE vehicle. I think that sounds about right. Um, Also, he's talking a lot about training, training technicians. This is something that we hear from people all the time. It's very, very new. It's something that technicians, you know, a lot of technicians, they just don't know how to work on these vehicles and having that training very, very important as they begin to proliferate our roads more and more and more and more of these are going into the shop. Technicians are going to need to know how to work on these vehicles. 
This was a great episode. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Hope to see you again soon. See you next time.